Hey, Spencer. Hey, Julia. So here's a question that I'm sure has fueled thousands and thousands of 3 a.m. dorm room conversations. <laughs> How do we know that we're not just living in a, a computer simulation? Well, I think the simple answer is that we don't know for sure. Okay, but can we say anything about how plausible it is? Well, part of the problem is that if the simulation is a really good one, then almost by definition you couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. And so you start to wonder, well, okay, well, what could I, what could prove to me that I'm, I am or I'm not living in a simulation? Uh, one simple thing that could prove to you that you are, pretty convincingly, is if, if it was a brain in a vat type scenario, where there's like you have a physical representation in that outer reality. A brain. A brain, right. for example. And in the like it, as in the Matrix, if you were able to step outside of the simulation into that outer reality, you'd say, ah, yes, I really was in a simulation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't prove that you're, when you're out there, you're not in a simulation. You could still be sure. in a simulation, but at least you know that in the lower level, you were also in a simulation. Right. I guess it wouldn't have to be just a brain. It could be an, an actual person that's just been hypnotized and, and deceived. Mm -hmm. Um, and so then the, another type of simulation that people talk about would be one in which we don't actually have a physical form. Mm -hmm. We're just, well, I mean, we, you know, that we uh, are getting better and better at creating artificial intelligences. So at least in theory, it's possible that someday we could actually create a conscious mind within a computer. So if we have that form, then we don't actually have any physical form aside from the electrical impulses in the in the computer. Right, so we would essentially be AIs in that case. Right, exactly. So um, there's one pretty famous argument from a few years ago by a, a philosopher named Nick Bostrom about why it's at least not unlikely that we are in that second kind of simulation. So let me lay it out for mm -hmm. you. He says, okay, it's at least plausible that at some point some civilization in the world, or sorry, in the universe, will advance to the point where they have enough computing power and also enough understanding of how minds and intelligence and consciousness work that they can create a computer simulation of, of those sophisticated minds that can interact with each other and interact with other uh, environments in the simulation. And so assuming that, uh, I mean, once you have the computing power and the know-how to do this, the only limitation on how many of these minds you can create is just, I guess, resource, the access to energy. Um, so as opposed to limitations on the proliferation of real beings in the real world, which are they're constrained by the time it takes for each generation to produce the next one, and they're constrained by physical resources and the amount of space on, on the planet, that sort of thing. So you wouldn't have any of those constraints for simulated beings in a simulated universe. Although there probably would be a certain amount of space occupied by the, the computer, and there would be computational limits. That's true. So it's really hard to know what those would be. I think, mm -hmm. uh, what did Nick, Bo Nick Bostrom estimated, like roughly based on all these assumptions, what the size of the computer would be in order for it to be powerful enough to, to simulate. I think all past human experience, I guess he, he's talking about simulating the brains in this case. Right. So what, what He said this? it would be about the size of a planet, but I feel like that's a pretty so wild like, range. Yeah, and I don't know. Planets take different he, sizes. I don't know how he gets to that, but... Anyway, so, but the core of his argument is that uh, once you've allowed for the possible, not entirely implausible existence of this simulated universe, and, and for the fact that there are far fewer, looser constraints on the number of beings that could be in the simulated universe as opposed to our universe, you have to acknowledge that it starts to look like the odds of you being one of the real beings are lower than the odds of you being a simulated being, just because they're far more of the latter than the former. Right, so most beings that exist are simulated rather than yes. real. Yes, thank you, yes. Well, so what do you think? Well, I mean, it raises a lot of questions. One interesting question it raises is whether we can use empirical data about our world today to talk about something outside of a simulation if we are in a simulation. And Bostrom's argument does that? Well, he does that when he talks about, oh, look, there are so many galaxies, so many planets, it seems likely that there may be other civilizations. That's true. Actually, just for clarity's sake, I, I believe he only makes this argument about Earth, that it, at some point in Earth's history, some, uh, in, in Earth, Earth's future, some civilization will be able to simulate past civilizations. Yeah, something so he's not actually assuming other galaxies. But What's kind of strange about these arguments is that if we are living a simulation, it's not at all clear whether, for example, Earth even exists. 
So to reference Earth and to talk about the likelihood of a simulation yeah. seems a little bit paradoxical. Uh, and it's not clear how you can get around that. I mean, you could imagine different kinds of outer worlds outside of a simulation. Some of them might even have different laws of physics than our own. Mm -hmm. If the laws of physics aren't even the same, I mean, really, not, like very little that we see could possibly have a bearing on what's outside of the simulation. OK. So we can't reason. So I guess the upshot of all this is that we can't reason using what we think we know about physics to, um, to draw conclusions about. Well, the simulation doesn't exist, then maybe you can. Right, but then we've already assumed our conclusions. We don't <laughs> right, need to reason at all. Um, what about, it seems like there should be some things that we could say that wouldn't depend on laws of physics that we could use to reason. Like uh, Daniel Dennett made an argument at the beginning of Consciousness Explained, uh, arguing that it would be uh, very, the, the amount of computing computations needed to actually run a simulated universe would just be so so huge as to be just completely um, invisible. And so he, he starts out by saying, you know, think about the amount of data that would be required just to simulate an experience in which you, the individual, are a passive observer. Um, you know, you, you have to well, all of our five senses, all of our thoughts, um, those would all require a lot of power to simulate. And then there are just thousands and thousands of choices that you can make on uh, any at any second in the timeline of the of the simulation you know you can choose to move your arm this way you can choose to move your other arm that way you can choose to speak you can choose to i mean there's just so many things you could do and so the simulation would have to um, be programmed to respond to any of those possible uh, choices and then each of those choices leads to another scenario with all a whole array of other different choices, and so you get get this very, very, very quickly multiplying exponential um, branching tree of possibilities that the simulation would have to be programmed for. See, that's sort of a choose your own adventure book view yeah. of simulation, but I don't think that's the only kind of simulation. You really don't need to pre-compute all the different possible paths. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could just simulate the laws of physics. So at every time step, you say, OK, let's apply the laws of physics, and let's move forward one time step. And you just keep iterating that process. Mm -hmm. Now, that raises some other questions. For example, Richard Feynman's talked about how, at a, he's a physicist, he's talked about at a very tiny level, there seems to be an infinite amount of bits. Mm -hmm. And as far as our conception of how physics works today, um, you need an infinite number of bits to, to store to even run a simulation of a tiny little region of space perfectly. And what that means is that any simulation is going to actually be imperfect and it's going to have errors. At every step in the, in the simulation there will be errors and presumably those errors will accumulate. So now it could be the case that our, our conception of physics is wrong and in fact there are simple rules that could be run error free without an infinite number of bits. Uh, but if that conception of physics is right, what it might mean is that even if you built a planet sized computer to simulate reality, that over a cert after a certain amount of time, the simulation may no longer be physically realizable. Like, you may get scenarios that are not physically possible, because you have this error that's creeping in at every stage and is growing. So that would be something like, if an object is traveling in a, a straight path, the laws of physics predict that it will continue in that path, but, but the actual simulation, there's some rounding error, some calculation error that's just inherent to the process, and so even though it's supposed to be at point x at the next like interval of time, it'll actually be at point x plus or minus some tiny amount. Right. And so it'll start to drift. Right, exactly. And every time we do an addition operation on a computer, we only have a finite number of decimal points that we right. are able to store. So there's always an error term. And the error is approximately random. It's being made every time we add numbers together. 